Introduction to Nuclear Technology Chapter 3 Fuel Manufacture First of all, to take a look at some fuel types, starting with those used in the UK. The original type was Magnox, essentially a rod of uranium metal with traces of iron and aluminium to improve the grain structure, slightly more than an inch in diameter and around 40 long. This is encased in a sheath of magnesium alloy. Designs vary, but generally feature spacing fins and helical grooves to promote thermal contact with the carbon dioxide reactor coolant. Some have longitudinal braces against bowing, which tends to occur with all fuel types in service. Neutron irradiation induces flaws in the crystal structure, causing a slight expansion which, like the neutron flux itself, is not generally uniform or symmetrical around individual elements. Operating at higher temperatures, the AGR uses oxide fuel, a poorer conductor of heat, and therefore contained in tubes of smaller diameter, this time of stainless steel, as pins filled with cylindrical pellets. Cylindrical clusters of these are arranged within a graphite sleeve that serves as a renewable portion of the moderator and fastened end-to-end -end as stringers to fill the channel housing them. Light Water Reactors Fuels for water-cooled types of reactor also use oxide pellets in tubes, though generally in tubes of zirconium alloy. They are mounted in clusters separated by spacer grids within which they are able to move longitudinally to allow for expansion, which the top fittings are designed to permit, though with springs to keep them in place against the coolant flow. PWR elements are wider than BWR. A 17 by 17 array is common, while BWR types may be divided internally into four 5x5 five five subarrays, with the whole encased in a shroud. All have channels for insertion of control rods or blades. CANDU CANDU fuel clusters, like those for the AGR, are cylindrical, about four inches in diameter and twenty long. Various internal arrangements are used. Manufacturing Stages Fuel manufacture inevitably started with mining. After half a century there are alternatives in the form of recovered or depleted uranium from past activities, and such have been used, for instance, for making over 1,600 tonnes of AGR fuel from recycled uranium, which may still have higher than natural uranium-235 content. In future, recycling may become essential, but for the time being, it is generally easier to use fresh material. Most uranium ores are not only distant from manufacturing plant, but of very low content. And to avoid transporting the vast amount of valueless material, they are locally milled to produce a uranium ore concentrate, or yellow cake, for export. After delivery, this is carefully purified and converted to uranium tetrafluoride. For Magnox, this was reduced directly to metal, cast into rods, machined to fit into the cladding, and then sealed. However, no more is being made. For oxide, uranium generally needs to be enriched a process of separating most of the uranium-238 in the vapour phase, and so requiring the volatile hexafluoride, to which the tetrafluoride is converted. The enriched hexafluoride is then converted to oxide, formed into pellets, fitted into cladding tubes, and sealed. Uranium mining. Now for a little more detail. Mining may be either open cast or underground, and since ores may contain as little as one part per thousand of uranium, a large amount must be extracted. 
most remaining eventually as mill tailings. As these contain decay products, notably radium, which is particularly noxious, they need careful containment that may not always have been as meticulous as it should have been. Consequently, extraction is by far the most environmentally damaging part of the whole fuel cycle. One argument for making the best possible use of uranium already extracted. Another method of extraction is in situ leaching. Feeding a dissolver liquor through one set of boreholes sunk into the ore body and recovering it from another. This avoids issues concerned with waste rock, although of course any of the liquor that escapes retrieval is beyond human control. Milling Except in the case of in situ leaching, this is a combination of mechanical and chemical processes depending on the characteristics of the particular site. Uranium occurs in many different chemical forms and much depends on the particular minerals involved, especially where other valuable elements are to be recovered at the same time. Solid ore is crushed and ground to a small particle size and may be roasted to denature clays and to destroy organic material or sulphides that would interfere with subsequent recovery. The highest oxide of uranium, the trioxide, is soluble in either acid or alkali, but lower oxides are less tractable and may need deliberate oxidation with, for instance, hydrogen peroxide or sodium chlorate. The treated ore may be leached with sulfuric acid or, where it is effective, with a mixture of sodium carbonate and bicarbonate that leaves most of the impurities behind. The resulting slurry may be filtered or treated directly by iron exchange or solvent extraction. An acid leachate may first be partly neutralised to get rid of iron and other impurities. Finally, the uranium is precipitated as oxide or ammonium or sodium diurinate, yellow cake. Uranium purification and conversion to uranium tetrafluoride. Uranium is almost unique among metals in being readily extracted from nitric acid into various organic solvents, of which tributyl phosphate TBP, is generally used for the purpose mixed with a hydrocarbon diluent such as the so-called odorless kerosene OK, to reduce its density and viscosity. The impure yellow cake received at the fuel manufacturing plant is therefore dissolved in nitric acid and extracted with TBPOK in a countercurrent mode that maximises recovery and separation from impurities. After backwashing into very dilute nitric acid the water is evaporated and the uranium nitrate, strictly uranyl nitrate, UO2, NO3 twice, decomposed by heat to the trioxide. The trioxide is then reduced with hydrogen to the dioxide and reacted with hydrofluoric acid to give the tetrafluoride. A fairly complicated sequence of operations is necessary to ensure a suitable physical form in the intermediates. Magnox manufacture. This, now ceased, involves reducing uranium tetrafluoride to metal with magnesium and casting it into rods. The crystal form of uranium stable at low temperatures is unusual in that on heating it contracts along one axis and expands along the other two, with undesirable effects during thermal cycling if the crystals should happen to be aligned. Accordingly, the rods were heated to transform the metal into a more conventionally behaved crystal structure, the beta phase, and suddenly quenched to freeze it, then annealed to relieve internal physical stresses. After machining to final shape, they were fitted into separately prepared Magnox sleeves, the internal spaces filled with helium and sealed. Finally, 
fittings were attached as required for the particular reactor. Oxide manufacture Oxide fuel generally needs a higher than natural fissile content which may be achieved either by adding plutonium or more commonly by removing much of the uranium-238. This is done in the vapour phase and for the purpose the uranium tetrafluoride produced as in slide 9 is converted to the volatile hexafluoride by a reaction with elemental fluorine. Neither enrichment process employed industrially gives a clean separation. Rather, a very slight shift in the proportions at each of many stages. Consequently, the plant produces two streams, a relatively small amount of uranium enriched to several percent uranium-235, and a much larger amount of tails, where the percentage is a few tenths. Various processes may be applied to convert the enriched uranium hexafluoride to an oxide powder suitable for further manufacture, but all amount to hydrolysis to form uranium trioxide, reducing it with hydrogen to the dioxide, compressing the dioxide powder into cylindrical pellets, sintering to convert the raw oxide into a ceramic, grinding the pellets to size, fitting them into cladding tubes, usually of a zirconium alloy, but sometimes stainless steel, filling with helium and sealing. The resulting pins, up to several hundred at a time, are mounted with spacers and other hardware to form fuel elements suited to the particular reactor type. Principles of Enrichment both methods depend on the fortunate coincidence that uranium forms a volatile hexafluoride and that fluorine has only one stable isotope of mass number 19. Consequently, the processes are concerned with only two molecular masses, 349 and 352. In the vapour phase, the lighter molecules on average move faster by a factor of 1.0043, the square root of the mass ratio. When uranium hexafluoride is passed through a porous membrane, the emerging vapour has thus a very slightly higher proportion of U235 than that which remains behind. That is the basis of the first enrichment process. The second, much more efficient, is based on high-speed centrifuges in which the heavier isotope favours the periphery. Other possibilities, based on selective excitation at the atomic or molecular level by means of lasers, never reached industrial exploitation because the availability of decommissioned weapon material threatened the economics. Gaseous Diffusion a single unit of a gaseous diffusion plant comprises the diffusion chamber itself, a compressor and associated pipework. Units are arranged in a cascade with U235 content increasing in one direction and decreasing in the other. Supposing the enriched end of the cascade to be on the left and the depleted on the right, an intermediate unit receives the slightly heavier fraction from the next unit to the left and the lighter fraction from the previous unit on the right. Thus there is a great deal of recirculating. The raw feed enters at the point corresponding to its own composition. Because the stage separation factor is so small, many units are needed in series to achieve the required degree of enrichment while well, because of the internal recirculation, many are needed in parallel, especially around the feed point, to handle the mass flow. Consequently, the plant has to be very large with a high power consumption, and the hold-up of material in it is so great that changing the product enrichment to suit different customers cannot be lightly undertaken. It may be more economic to over-enrich and blend down as required. 
centrifuge. Not only do centrifuges have a higher stage separation factor than diffusion units, but by setting up an internal circulation within the centrifuge, for instance through thermal convection, it is possible to achieve several stages within each unit. In consequence, the material holdup is two and a half thousand times less than in an equivalent diffusion plant, and operation can be much more flexible. Formation into fuel elements The enriched uranium hexafluoride is converted to dioxide by one of several processes, essentially of hydrolysis and chemical reduction, designed to yield a free-flowing powder that can be compressed into dense pellets. An intermediate stage may be to form soft granules. The powder is compressed within a suitable dye to form a pellet strong enough to stand manipulation, preferably through its own cohesion, although binders have been used. But compression alone will not achieve the required density. To reach this, and convert the material to a ceramic, the pellets are heated to a temperature of about 1750 degrees centigrade, at which the grains do not melt, but shrink and coalesce. Because of internal friction within the pellet, the full force of the press is effective only at the ends, which are therefore less porous than the middle, and shrink less during sintering. The sintered pellets therefore have a somewhat hyperboloid form, and must be ground to the required uniform diameter. Stacks of pellets are then fitted into cladding tubes that are filled with helium, sealed, and assembled into fuel elements. Uranium oxide is by no means the ultimate fuel. The nitrite has also been favoured, as having a higher proportion of the useful element and a substantially higher thermal conductivity meaning that the coolant can be run hotter, so raising the thermodynamic efficiency of electricity generation, or the pins made thicker, and therefore cheaper in aggregate, without increasing the centre-line temperature, and so threatening the integrity of the fuel. Thorium seems to be going through one of its periodic revivals of interest. Although not fissile itself, nor at all readily fissionable, even in a fast neutron flux. It is fertile and can breed fissile uranium-233 with interesting consequences, discussed in the fifth chapter. Briefly, it offers the possibility of extended residence in a reactor and generating less of some long-lived waste products than does uranium. Coated particle fuel has been mentioned in connection with high temperature reactors. Its robustness in containing fission products suggests the possibility of waste disposal with minimal packaging. Special fuels might be used for disposing of long-lived radionuclides such as the minor actinides, again discussed in the fifth chapter. Metal alloy fuels might be used for their high thermal conductivity and possible suitability for non-aqueous pyrochemical reprocessing, again with perhaps simpler waste issues. Finally, pyrochemical processing could lead to a closely integrated system with molten salt fuel circulating continuously between reactor, steam generator and cleanup.